So, welcome everybody, here we are, uh, during UK City of Culture 2017 and at, I suppose, the centrepiece, the, actually one of the foundations of the whole thing, during the Freedom Festival um, and the City Hall, you didn't have to pay for your tickets, but it is sold out, so that's wonderful. And we've got an outside broadcast going on, a webcast by the BBC. But we're all here waiting to hear Kofi Annan, no less. <laughs> and we are so, so pleased that you're here. Uh, I, I have a friend sitting up there who um, realised that you were sitting in front of her on Thursday night at uh, uh, Whole Truck Theatre. And she, <laughs> she touched you and grabbed your hand and shook it and said, thank you. So... Um, we're not always terribly eloquent in Hull, but we do want to say thank you for all of your work <laughs> and all of what you have to share with us. But in the next three or four minutes, I have to say a few other things. I'm Andy Dalton. I'm chair of the Wilberforce Lecture Trust and a Hull City Councillor. And on behalf of those things, I welcome you and especially people from Ghana and Freetown, Sierra Leone, and maybe you're from some other wonderful places. So welcome to you as well. I need to say some thank yous um, and then some words about Kofi Annan, a little bit about the Lecture Trust and then a sentence about why I think this is so important for Hull. So the thank yous, I'm not sure if he's actually turned up, but I want to say thank you to Councillor Colin Inglis who was the only chair of the Trust until January this year. He had the vision, the wit, the nous, probably the guile to create this thing in 1995. And he organised Wallace Inca, Desmond Tutu, Hanan Ashwari, and a host of other uh, senior politicians, a bunch of archbishops, and a load of other people as well. Good on you, Colin. Thank you, Lord Prescott, who I know is sitting down there somewhere, because without his contact with Mr. Anan, uh, Mr. Anan wouldn't be here. So we're very grateful to you, Lord Prescott. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the support of the City Council, who are paying for a good deal of this, and for the time of many officers, Trish and Fiona and lots of others, and also to the events team and the City of Culture team for mounting this spectacle and making sure that it's all going to run perfectly. As long as I do, okay. You can read about Kofi Annan on the Wonder Web, like you can read about just about anybody else. So I'm only going to make a few comments, and these things are well known. A career in the UN, and then Secretary General for 10 years from January 1997. And it seems to me in reading that he created the space, the impetus, the drive that gave rise to what most of us have heard of being the Millennium Development Goals. And I guess that that impetus was a large part of the reason why he received the Nobel Peace Prize, along with the United Nations. But I guess in recognition that institutions can do things, but they need individuals with vision and drive and determination to make those things happen. So, <laughs> you did that, clearly. Um, and I guess nearly all of us would find it hard to imagine bearing the hopes, the potential, well, of the whole world, uh, or even just its one billion most impoverished people, who are often more or less enslaved people. So, again, we are really looking forward to the sort of the wisdom and the insight and the vision that you have accrued as a result of that incredibly special position. Just a word about the Wilberforce Lecture Trust. On your seat, there's a flyer. It's also an envelope if you want to put something in it. But there's a flyer, stick it in your pocket, and when you discover it in a week's time, go on the website and listen to a whole load of other fascinating people, I've mentioned some of them already, who will inspire you around freedom, around anti-slavery, around human dignity, around democracy. Please use that website, um, because you know, that is a large purpose of this, to make these available to people, to go on inspiring people. Lastly, I just want to say, sort of, why here, <laughs> why now, so what? Well, you know, I've said it's the year of culture and it's the Freedom Festival and there is a Wilberforce lecture. 
that the Friesen Festival started 10 years ago as, I believe, a means of popularising an idea that Wilberforce and his conspirators, his conspirators, his collaborators, did so much to advance 200 years ago with the culmination of the, the act that abolished the slave trade. And I'm really grateful to Mikey Martins and the uh, Freedom Festival team for their desire to put freedom and what it means, not just having a good time, but uh, freedom and what that word really conveys, front and centre of the Freedom Festival, and that's wonderful. Now, there have been other people doing things more recently than 200 years ago. There's a woman called Isabel Carter and a women's prayer group out in a church hall in South Cave, not a million miles away from here, who came up with the idea of Jubilee 2000, which must somehow have dovetailed with what you were trying to do and resulted in a load of debt forgiveness, or at least lessening of the interest rates, to a load of indebted nations. So, we have some form around here, we have some history, we have some institutions. Hopefully there's something in the water or in the mud or something. So what I want, personally, as Hull emerges a different place from its year in the limelight, is that we will find a renewed purpose in this world. And that, that might be something to do with saying something to the world about freedom, about emancipation, about justice, about human dignity. So, Mr. Anand, we hope that you will help us with that, you know, give us purpose and encouragement to get on with it. So, Mr. Anand, the Wolf of Force Lecture, Freedom in the 21st Century. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor to be here with you today uh, to deliver the Wilberforce Lecture. I would also want to thank Lord Prescott, my dear friend John, for his persistence, because without that, Nan and myself will not be here uh, this weekend. And I can tell you, we are thoroughly enjoying ourselves. Standing here today in the city of Hall, I truly feel the weight of history. It is only 10 years since the bicentenary of the abolition of the Slave Trade Act passed by Parliament in 1807. This important step toward the total abolition of slavery in the British Empire was driven by the tireless work of the abolition movement, including William Wilberforce, the MP from Kingston and Hall. Whilst slavery existed in many forms throughout the world, it was the European powers, Britain among them, who brought this terrible trade in human life into a new global economic system. Ships departed from Europe, European ports, to trading stations in West Africa, collecting the human cargo bound for the New World. They returned to these shores laden with the riches of the Americas, a triangular trade that integrated vast regions of the world into the world economy, but at a terrible price. Indeed, one of the centers of the slave trade was located in what would centuries later become my home country, Ghana, which celebrated its 60th anniversary of its independence this year. In such ways do the shadows of the past bind us together in common history. With this in mind, Allow me to turn to the theme I wish to discuss in this lecture, that most central of human rights, freedom. Enshrined in the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the simple yet profound truth. 
all human beings are born equal and free and equal in dignity and rights. And yet, it is clear that around the world, too many people do not enjoy this fundamental right. While the courage and dedication of people like William Wilberforce ended the hateful institution of slave trade, the sad fact is that slavery is not of one time and one place. Article 4 of the Declaration of Human Rights may expressly prohibit slavery, but the commercialization of human life, humanity rendered into merchandise, continues today in many forms. The International Labour Organization estimates that 21 million people are victims of forced labour, many of whom are not only, economic, not only economically, but also sexually exploited. Debt bondage entraps entire families in cycles of exploitation which no amount of hard work can break. Human traffickers use deceptive and <coughs> deception and coercion to force people into any number of forms of exploitation from forced prostitution, begging, domestic servitude, and even organ removal. In order to consider the plight of millions of children or consider the plight of the millions of children who are serving working as laborers on farms in fishing boats across the globe, and this is all too common a sight in my own region of West Africa. Even harsher are the lives of the world's 300,000 child soldiers forced to fight and work in circumstances no child should be made to suffer. It is usually vulnerable populations, such as migrants, women, children, and indigenous groups who suffer the most. The legal instruments, the legal instruments outlawing slavery and human trafficking at both the national and international levels are numerous and well-developed. Yet, criminal elements engaged in human trafficking are too often able to do so with impunity. Today's slavery must be tackled as aggressively as Wilberforce and his peers did two centuries ago, while recognizing that it is perhaps less overtly brutal and exploit exploitative ways. Millions and millions more are far from being free, truly free around the world. We should also not underestimate the strides made by successive waves of democratization. Yet repressive political systems around the world continue to trample on human rights and dignity. Indeed, the 2016 Freedom House Report on Political Rights and Civil Liberties marked the 11th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. While most states no longer openly contest the principles of democracy and elections, many merely use the facade of democracy as a veil to obscure the reality of authoritarian rule. Even in more mature democracies, there is a sense that institutions and processes are not functioning properly or not in the interest of the people. Alongside political forces, we must also tackle the inequalities in our socio-economic systems which work to constrain freedom, enabling the rich and the privileged to exploit the weak. Our systems must not only ensure that people enjoy freedom from want, but also provide equal 
access to opportunity for all. Globalization has helped lift millions of people out of poverty and created untold opportunities and innovations. Almost two decades ago, the United Nations Global Compact brought companies together, requesting them to align their operations with universal principles of human rights, core labor standards, the environment, and anti-corruption. I believe then, and I believe now, that global market had to be embedded in the framework of common rules and values, which would ensure that its economic benefits would not gravitate only towards a few. In default of such a framework, I warned then that a backlash of isms from protectionism to populism to fanaticism would exploit the vulnerability of those left behind by globalization. Unfortunately, much of this has come to pass. In both the developing world and developed world, millions of people are trapped in recurring cycles of poverty and deprivation. Many go hungry and even more suffer from malnutrition which affects people in every country. Climate change, perhaps the single greatest threat we face, is rendering these challenges more immediate and more complex. Climate change is likely to drive new dynamics of mass migration. Already, an average of 20 million people are displaced each year by natural hazards. And this summer, this number, and we saw what is happening this summer, this number is only set to rise. With current levels of migration already straining the global system, managing the movement of these climate refugees promises to be a Herculean task. The effects of challenging climate of changing climate on the world economy will also generate new economic pressures, changing patterns of consumption and production. These, in turn, could create more economically vulnerable populations who are at risk of exploitation. The global and national response to these pressures will greatly test existing political structures, with the risk that some will resort to repression to manage the change. I know the situation I have laid out is dire, but we should not lose hope. Instead, we should take inspiration from the legacy of Wilberforce and the abolitionists, who proved that when individuals decide to take personal responsibility and work together, they can transform the world. Their example and that of those, uh, and that of those others throughout history who fought for freedom and dignity serve as our call to action. And with the adoption of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, we now have a compelling and ambitious vision for moving forward. We must now demonstrate the leadership and the will to put that vision into practice. Just as the problems we face are interconnected, so too are the solutions. I am pleased to see that good work is being done right here in Hull, connecting local expertise of estuarial development on the Humber with similar regions in Africa in, in a pioneering approach to sub-national cooperation. We will need precisely this sort of innovative global cooperation to tackle the challenges we face. I have always believed 
that healthy, prosperous, and democratic societies are built on three pillars, peace and security, inclusive development, and the rule of law and respect for human rights. For there can be no long-term peace and security without development. And there can be no long-term development without peace and security and stability. And no society, no society can long remain prosperous without respect for rule of law and human rights. The slave trade may be gone, but exploitation and oppression are still with us. To paraphrase William Wilberforce, we may choose to look the other way, but we can never say again that we did not know. So we must all search our consciences and face the problems of the world head on. No wrong is so deep that it can never be made right. Inspired by this knowledge and with the example of past generations, let us continue their great work so that one day all humanity may be free. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am Professor John Oldfield, the director of the Wilberforce Institute and one of the tr trustees of the Wilberforce Lecture Trust. And it is my very great pleasure to offer a brief vote of thanks to this morning's speaker. As many of you will know, 2017 it marks the 210th anniversary of the Slave Trade Abolition Act, a piece of legislation that will be forever associated with the name of Wilber, William Wilberforce, one of Hull's own sons. We are justifiably proud of Wilberforce's legacy of freedom, which we celebrate this weekend. Uh, the Freedom Festival is about music, and it's about performance, and it's about having a good time, but it has always had a serious intent, namely to reflect upon the meaning of freedom. And I'm sure you will agree with me that what we've heard today speaks directly and very eloquently to this theme. Kofi Annan has given us a brilliant meditation on the meaning of freedom in the 21st century, wide-ranging, thoughtful, and typically measured in its conclusions. We take heart in what you have said today about the need to defend our human rights and the importance of the rule of law. We take these things for granted, but in many countries around the world, these things are very fragile indeed. We also recognize the importance of leadership and what you have said about climate change, globalization, and the challenges that the modern world faces us with. It's also, I think, personally for me, particularly pleasing that you have drawn to the attention of this audience the modern scourge of slavery, trafficking, and enormous injustices that trap people in lives of quite desperate, desperate futures, no futures at all. So it's, in, it's a very, very important that this message particularly at this time and in this year, a city of culture, that these messages are broadcast 
far and wide. These are important lessons for a troubled world and lessons that are especially salient during this Festival of Freedom. And we thank you very much indeed for today's lecture. I just wanted to echo, echo something that Councillor Dawson said at the beginning. We could not have done this, the trust on, on our own. Lots of people have helped us. I'd like to echo what he has said about Trish Dolby and a whole wonderful team at Hull City Council. They've been towers of strength. I'd also like to echo what Andy said about Lord Prescott. It was Lord Prescott who first floated the idea of bringing Kofi and Anne to Hull. And just as important, and this is the key thing, he made it happen. And we thank you very much for doing that. Um, <laughs> above all, however, we thank you, Kofi, for your stirring lecture and for your presence in Hull. This means, I'm sure I'll echo all your thoughts about this, we really value your presence here in this, this particularly this year of City of Culture. We have one last honor to perform. From time to time, the Wilberforce Lecture Trust awards the Wilberforce Medallion to an individual or organization that has made an outstanding contribution to the furtherance of human rights and democracy. On the occasion of your visit to Hull, we are immensely proud to announce that in 2017, the Wilberforce Medallion goes to Kofi Annan and to the Kofi Annan Foundation. So if you'd like to. That, that concludes the formal part of the proceedings and those that are being live streamed. We're now going to pause and then we'll have a question and answer session which will be chaired by Councillor Dorton. Thank you very much.